Good afternoon and thank you for joining us on this webinar today on managing retention schemes in the GCC. This webinar will be led by Robert Mosley. Before we start, I'd like to take you through a few details about the HR Observer. The HR Observer is basically an initiative by the Informer Middle East and it is a platform for HR professionals in the Middle East to exchange insights and expertise. Please do go uh, online and have a look. There's a lot of articles, white papers, videos, podcasts, webinars as well that you can have a look at. Moving on, some housekeeping rules. Please do wait to the end of the session to type your questions. Time will be allocated at the end to address your questions. The slides will be available on our SlideShare page for the next four weeks and we will email a link to you. Similarly, the webinar recording will also be available for the next four weeks and we will email the link to you. At the end of the webinar, there will be a survey that will pop up on your screen. Please do take the time to complete this for us. I would now like to tell you a few words about our presenter today, Robert Mosley. Well, Robert is a very senior associate with Informa he has his own a consulting business called Lemon Pip Consulting in the UK, where he works with over 400 companies. Um, he has been, uh, well, you can read his bio, which is on the screen right now, but I'd like to say something that's not mentioned on the screen. Well, Robert um, is considered as a guru in mainly compensation and benefits amongst other HR functions. He also chairs the Compensation and Benefits Forum every year in the Middle East. He's been chairing it for the past three years now. Yeah, um, so I'm sure you'll benefit a lot from this webinar. Thank you very much for joining in. And over to you now, Robert. So good afternoon, everybody. Um, if a few of you can just type the word yes so that we know you're hearing this loud and clear, that would be helpful. So uh, Rhoda, Adnan, Anas, Fahad, thank you for typing yes. I'm glad you can hear me. At least that's four of you. Janice as well. Great. We've got quite a few yeses coming in. It's actually the, um, the 21st Comp and Ben Forum uh, coming up um, in two weeks' time the 29th, 30th, 31st of May and the 1st of June. And this will be the 11th one that I've actually been the chairman of. Time flies, Mega, it's more than three. Anyway, so let's, uh, let's look at the subject of retention schemes. What's going on in the Middle East? What is typical for retaining key employees and any bonus schemes on top. Um, I'd ask you to hold your questions back until the end, because uh, the way this technology works, I only see the questions when I hit the, the view questions box. So if you type any questions in the next half hour or so while I'm speaking, I will lose them all. But when I get to questions at the end, type them in then, and I'll address the ones uh, that we can in the time today. So retention schemes in the Gulf region. Uh, my background, for those of you that don't know me, I've actually been in the region now for just over 20, 26 years. Um, I came out to the region back in the mid-80s with Hay Group um, and then joined Emirates Airline back in uh, 1990 and stayed 14 years with Emirates, ending up as the Senior Vice President for Human Resources. Went up the coast to Qatar Airways as head of HR there for a few years, uh, then off to the States as head of Global Reward for Travelport Galileo. And then in 2009, I set my own consulting business up, just me, mainly doing Comp and Ben in the Middle East and performance management, performance appraisals, compensation schemes, grading schemes, retention plans, etc. I'm now working with about 450 different companies in the region uh, and on the remuneration committees of, of almost that many as well. Um, and I've been here in Dubai now since uh, mid 80s, so 26, 27 years. So the subject today, retention. Where does it actually start? It starts the moment that you start recruiting somebody 
from the very, very first meeting that you have with a potential future employee, you've actually already started sowing the seeds of retention. So you need to make the right impression in recruitment, and you need to also make sure that you're recruiting the people that you want to retain. That means having a detailed first interview to screen out the candidates based on their technical abilities, the capabilities of doing the job or the technical competencies. And then a detailed second interview where instead of looking at the technical competencies, you're looking at the behavioral competencies, the fit of the person with the organization. And back it up with a really good psychometric test. In my personal view, the best one in the Middle East is the Myers-Briggs type indicator, the MBTI. But PAPI, 16PF are also very, very good recruitment tools. Not as one of your primary decision makers, but as a, a secondary piece of information to tell you if your judgment that you've made in the interviews is a good judgment and is backed up through the psychometrics. It carries on, retention carries on when they actually start employment. So you need to be fair and equitable, especially in your remuneration. If you break that psychological contract, if you get remuneration wrong, retention immediately is going to go out of the window. So you need to get your remuneration correct and competitive. A clear pay strategy with pay scales that are benchmarked and competitive with the market. Clear job descriptions for each job, setting out the accountabilities of the role, the key result areas, and a job description that you can give to the employee to say, this is what we expect, this is what we want you to do. Clear performance goals at the beginning of each year linked to the job description. If there's eight sentences in the job description, there should be eight KPIs, performance indicators, aligned to the KRAs. Clear communications as the year goes on so that each employee knows how well they're doing and what's expected of them, and a really good competency framework as well. So it's not just the what an employee achieves that matters, but it's also how they achieve those things. Maybe identifying between six and eight competencies at each job maybe even having up to 50% of those eight, maximum of four, as being compulsory competencies to reflect the core values of your business. Build your brand, build your employer value proposition, and embed it in your competencies. Clear HR policies and a very good, well-written procedures manual so that each employee knows their rights, they know what the company expects of them, but also they know what they can expect from the company as the policy manual needs to set out both sides of the equation. And make sure you're using the golden triangle in how you manage the remuneration of your staff. Make sure that your HR department is following all the best practices in the golden triangle. If you're wondering what the golden triangle is, it's all linked down to compensation and performance and motivation. If we're really going to reward the employee fairly and motivate them properly, then we need to know all about the job. Organization design, job analysis, job descriptions, job evaluation, and grading. Have we put the job in the right grade? Are we treating it fairly? If you get that wrong, retention gets harder and harder. But it's not just the job, it's also the person. How well do we know the employee? And are we able to measure and manage their performance? Based on the job description, can we set some clear key result areas and key performance indicators? Can we say to the employee, these are your goals, these are your objectives? But it's not just what you achieve, the goals and objectives, it's how you achieve them, the behaviors and competencies. At the beginning of the year, we do performance management and set the goals and set the behaviors. And at the end of the year, we do performance appraisals. Don't be misled by all these cheeky 
internet articles at the moment with newspaper headline stories that read something like Microsoft have abandoned their annual performance appraisal scheme. All of these stories are truly sensationalist. Nobody's actually abandoned the schemes whatsoever. What they are doing is trying to abandon the formal end of year meeting and replacing it with much more regular month to month meetings so that by the end of the year there's no surprises. But appraisal schemes are very much still in place and are very key if we're going to communicate to the employee and retain the ones that matter to us. Out of the appraisal should come a rating scale and those ratings should be linked to the pay review, the annual pay remuneration increase and possibly also the bonus scheme. And don't forget the outside world as well. What's your pay strategy? Can you get hold of market pay data? Are you benchmarking properly to make sure you're competitive? And have you designed optimal pay scales, pay ranges and allowances that are going to allow you to attract, retain and motivate your key employees? Get the golden triangle right. But it carries on beyond that. Retention then goes into career development, talent management, and engagement. Make sure that every employee has a development plan every year. Not just the poor performers on how they need to improve, but all, em all employees, the satisfactory performers, how can they hope to become excellent? The top performers, what can they do in order to get eligible for their next career move or their future promotion increase? a development plan for every employee every year. And also develop your managers to make sure that they're good at giving feedback and good at coaching. If you think about all of the managers that you've had in your career so far, the ones that stand out will be those that were good at coaching you and helping you with feedback. Identify the issues that motivate your employees. And probably for your top performers, money is going to be one of the key motivators. So make sure that you have a really good performance appraisal system and that you're able to identify those top performers. Typically in a five point performance appraisal scale, where the top point is outstanding or significantly exceeds expectations, you could well have 5% of your employees in that category. And in the fourth point, excellent, exceeds expectations, you could easily have 25, 30% of your employees in that category. These are the top performers that you need to retain. Have a hypo career development plan as part of your talent management strategy that you visibly put the top 5 to 10% of your employees into. Put them on a pedestal. Let the whole community know that they're in a high potential career development plan. They're performing well. They've got the potential for the future. And maybe one day each month, off they go on a special development plan as an elite group of employees because they are your future talent. Don't make any secrets about this scheme. Make it an aspiration that other employees want to try and get up to. And every two to three years, do an opinion survey, a climate survey of your staff. Find out about their feelings. Are they happy with the company? Are you doing all the things that they expect you to do? Are you meeting all your obligations as an employer? Are they satisfied with the bonding contract, the relationship between them as an employee and you as an employer? And monitor your attrition levels and your turnover levels. Attrition and turnover are two very stati different statistical terms. Attrition is the percentage of employees that voluntarily resign of their own free will as a percentage of your total workforce in a rolling 12-month period, whereas turnover is all employees that leave for any reason, total churn as a percentage of your total workforce. Turnover includes attrition plus 
all those employees that leave because maybe they've reached the end of their three-year service contract or they reach retirement age or they're terminated for poor performance or any other reason that the relationship comes to an end. If attrition, voluntary resignations, creeps up above 10%, then it's time to investigate why. And if turnover, total churn, creeps up above 15%, then it's time to investigate why. Usually, it's because of money. 10% on attrition is my red warning bell. But even this isn't enough. You've got to get into the psyche. What motivates your employees? Now, thankfully, there was a really big study done a couple of years ago um, by the big HR communities looking at what motivates employees. And here's the results for the Middle East region. The biggest four motivators were not money at all. It was, do I enjoy a good relationship with my boss? Do I have a good reputation at work? Do I find my work fun and challenging and important? Do I get appreciation from my colleagues? Do I get recognition from my management? Money only comes in at number five in that list. But more interestingly, if we narrow down this survey, and instead of looking at all employees, we look at top performers only, the list changes dramatically. What do top performers want? They want a job that is tailored to the things they love doing and they're good at. They want money to be better than their colleagues. Salary increases above the market average. And they're hugely motivated by the existing financial reward system, the bonus system, etc. If they perform well, they expect to be remunerated well. But they also want to learn new skills in order that they can develop themselves and move forward. And they're also looking for opportunities for promotion. If you're not promoting your top performers, your top 5 to 10% of people every three years, then they'll leave you to join a company that will promote them. And they're also interested in flexible work schedules, which in the Middle East is still well behind the rest of the world in terms of the percentage of companies that will do that. Top performers are less bothered about who their boss is. They have an attitude of, well, I'm a top performer. I might get promoted in two or three years. I might have a new boss. Top performers are less bothered about, is the work interesting? They'll find a way to make it interesting. What motivates a top performer? Money, promotion, and future enrichment. So these are the people we've got to retain. It means that simply doing the golden triangle and doing all those good talent management things like hypo schemes isn't enough. You need something extra on top. And it's typically called a cash retention bonus scheme. These things are unbelievably secretive and confidential in the Middle East. Most people in HR don't even think they exist. And they certainly don't think their own company does it. And yet, remarkably, about 80%, 80% of companies in the region have one of these highly secretive, highly confidential retention cash bonus schemes. So what do they look like? Above all, you have to retain your critical 10% of talent, your top performers who are going to be your future business leaders. So you've got to get some things right. You need to identify who they are. Who are the most important 10% of your employees who are both performing well today and have the potential to be your future leaders? And we're going to look at something in a moment called the nine box techniques, one of the standard talent management tools that will give you the ability to identify this critical 10% of employees. But more than that, you need to retain them. And you're probably going to put your top 5% of people 
maximum top 10% of people, your key performers, your stars for the future, into one of these really secretive cash-based retention bonus schemes. Usually they're three years long. Retaining someone for two years or one year isn't really that advantageous to the company. It's easy to do. You've already got your six months or three months notice periods. So one year, two year isn't that much more. We're normally looking to lock people in for a three year period. That is meaningful for the company. But on the other hand, employees are unlikely to want to get locked in for four or five years or more because who knows what you're going to be doing in five years time. We all need flexibility. So most of the cash-based bonus schemes in the GCC are three years duration, typically aimed at locking in the top 5%, maybe maximum 10% of talent. Who are the people that we've identified through the nine box techniques as being critical for the future of the business? So how do we actually do it? Step by step. We are looking at three year schemes that are highly selective and highly secretive. Highly selective. It's not based on grade. It's not even based on job. It's specific named individuals. You might have a job of business development manager with three people doing that job. One of them might be selected for the scheme. The other two aren't. You might have a financial controller that you want to retain, but a chief financial officer above them that you don't want to retain. It's possible that a subordinate is in the scheme, but their boss has no idea that the scheme exists. It is highly selective for specific named employees, and it is highly secretive. Probably the only people that knows this exists is the head of HR that's running the scheme and those people lucky enough to be selected to be in the scheme. The rest of HR have no idea that this is happening. The scheme is therefore managed and run by the head of HR personally. Not by the head of talent, not by the head of comp and ben, not by anyone else in HR. It's managed by the head of HR personally. The head of HR will meet with the head of each department one-on-one, -on -one, and they won't even mention the word retention. What they will say is, I'm doing a talent management audit. I'm reviewing the caliber of the talent, the employees we have in the organization. So let's talk about our people. The official reason that the head of HR is doing this, the highly secretive reason, is that the head of HR is going to try and build a list of named employees, maximum 5 to 10% of the total workforce, that the head of HR is going to consider for inclusion in the retention cash-based bonus schemes. But they can't say that to the heads of department, because maybe the heads of departments themselves aren't going to be in the scheme. So instead, they simply say to the head of departments, we're doing a talent management review and a talent management audit. The head of HR, though, is using this talent management audit to secretly decide who are the most important 5 to 10% of our employees that need to be retained for the next three years. So the first question is, how does the head of HR identify who these people will be? And I'll address that in about five minutes time when we look at the talent management nine box techniques. If you are one of the lucky people to be selected by the head of HR to be one of these special five to 10%, then you're actually going to get a letter hand delivered personally from the head of HR. The head of HR is going to build up this list of names. So if there's any head of HRs listening, I've got some bad news for you. You can't put your own name in the list. 
So the first person who is not eligible to be in this scheme is the head of HR themselves. They're going to present this list of names to the CEO and only the CEO, maybe the remuneration committee as well, but no other management member will get to see this list. Second piece of bad news, if you're listening to this webinar and you're a CEO, you can't nominate yourself either for the scheme. So now we've got two people who can't be in the scheme, the head of HR and the CEO. But everybody else is up for potential consideration. If you are identified as one of these top 5% to 10% of people that need to be retained, then the head of HR is going to hand deliver a letter personally to you. In fact, they're even going to probably hand deliver it to your home address, not in the workplace. Why the home address? This letter is going to make you a very good financial offer. If you promise not to resign for the next three years, then the company is going to invest heavily in your career development. And if you keep your promise not to resign, then at the end of three years, ka you're going to get a nice cash bonus to say thank you for keeping your promise and staying with the company for three years. Now, if you got one of these letters, and if you were married, the first person you're going to tell is your husband or wife. I challenge any of you to get one of these letters and to keep it secret from your spouse. So of course you're going to tell your husband or wife. And the head of HR knows that. So the head of HR is going to meet you at your home address to deliver this letter because not only is the employee going to sign a confidentiality statement, the spouse is also going to sign the confidentiality statement. The last thing we want is employee A getting a letter telling their spouse who tells another one of their friends over coffee who then tells their spouse, employee B, and the cat's out of the bag. Nope, you've got to keep this letter secret. These letters, when signed by the employee, will then be personally filed and kept by the head of HR. Most head of HRs have one of these secret folders called File 13. If you've ever numbered why 13 is considered to be an unlucky number, it's because if your name isn't in File 13 and you're not in the retention scheme, then you're really unlucky. And that's the origin of unlucky 13. These files, these letters are kept in a secret file personally by the head of HR. These letters go nowhere near the employee file. If they went in the employee file, well, everybody in HR would know about it. And HR is probably one of the most leaky, squeaky gossip mongers in the world. So everybody in the company is going to know about it. And we don't want that. These letters are kept by the head of HR personally. The employee's told that if they tell anyone that they've got this letter, then that is a breach of serious confidentiality and is potentially cause for disciplinary action that's gross misconduct. It is a very, very serious offence to reveal that you have one of these highly confidential letters so serious that it's grounds for termination and dismissal. This letter is going to offer the employee some super duper fantastic career development, maybe even a one year MBA course sponsored by the company or some accelerated management learning. And it's going to offer them a cash retention bonus that if they promise to stay for three years, and they keep that promise, then at the end of three years, they'll get an extra bonus over and above the rest of the package, in addition to the annual company bonus scheme, in addition to their salary, etc. They have to keep the promise not to resign for three years, and their performance rating must always be satisfactory or higher if they're going to get 
this bonus. If the employee keeps the promise, then at the end of three years, ka will pay the bonus out. And those payments will be processed by the CFO as an ex gratia handwritten check. Nowhere near payroll. So sadly, the third person that's not eligible is now the CFO. So that's the head of HR, the CEO, and the CFO who can't be in the scheme because they're the three that know it's happening. The letters aren't in the employee file. The payments aren't in payroll. It's an ex gratia handwritten check delivered by the CFO. This is the extent to which companies will go to keep these schemes very confidential. Well, the second question that obviously rears its head is just how much money are we talking about? At the end of three years, in addition to everything else, the salary, the allowances, the annual bonus schemes, the incentives, how much extra money are we looking at for these people who are in a retention cash-based bonus scheme? So this is the mechanics, and it, there's two questions outstanding. Who are the 5 to 10% of people that might be lucky enough to make it into this scheme? And how much money might they get at the end of the three-year period? Who and how much? Let's look at the who first. How do we go about identifying these top 5 to 10% of employees, our key talent that we need to retain. Who are the people that are going to be selected? Well, the head of HR is going to meet each head of department to say, I'm doing a talent management audit. So they will use the typical nine box techniques to do a talent management review. And there's two primary approaches. The nine box of talent management and the nine box of flight risk. Let me take you through each of those in turn. This is the nine box of talent management. It's a three by three matrix. And if you're good at maths, three by three is nine. That's why it's called nine box techniques. On the X axis along the bottom, how good was the performance of the employee over the past 12 months? Was it high? They were rated five, outstanding. Was it medium? They were rated four, excellent. Or was it low? They were rated three, satisfactory, or lower. Five on the right, four in the middle, three, two, one on the left. And on the vertical axis, the y-axis, how likely is it that the employee has the potential to be promoted in the next two, maybe three years. At the top, the potential is high. They're ready for promotion and they're probably ready now in the next 12 months. In the middle, the potential is medium. They'll probably be ready for promotion next year or the year after, somewhere within the next three years, but they're not quite ready yet this year, maybe next year. And at the bottom, unlikely. They don't have the potential to be promoted in the near future. The head of HR will sit down with the head of each department and they'll go through the names of each employee one at a time and allocate each employee into one of these nine boxes. If your name is in those green boxes, the chances of you being in the retention scheme have just improved dramatically. These are the people we want to retain, the high performers with high potential for the future. If your name's in one of those two blue boxes, current performance, nothing special, maybe a three, satisfactory, but potential, wow. If only we could find the job that gets you passionate, gets you motivated. The potential is huge. So let's rotate you until we find the right job that brings out your passion and releases your potential. 
If you're in the red boxes, performance is good or excellent, but future career potential is a little bit limited. You've reached the top of your principles. But while your performance is good, we need to reward you, to say thank you for your good performance. The yellow box, performance is good, potential is good, maybe next year. So let's give you coaching, let's give you development to get you ready for when you might be promoted next year. And the bottom left-hand side, the brown box, do nothing. This is called the nine box of talent management. And the head of HR is getting interested in the people's names that are coming in those three green boxes. By the way, if you're colorblind, the three green boxes are middle right, top right, and middle and top center. They are the people who we need to retain. But then we'll do another nine box techniques called the nine box of retention and flight risk. Again, it's a three by three matrix. Along the X axis, along the bottom, based on all the things we know about the employee, how likely is it that they're going to resign in the next two years? On the right hand side, it's very likely. We already know through monitoring their use of the company internet that they're surfing for jobs at other companies. We already know from their last performance review that they've said they're looking to move on in their career, maybe go back home or move jobs when their spouse or husband or wife moves jobs, etc. We already know through other intelligence that they're likely to resign in the next year. In the middle, there's a chance they might resign, it's medium. And on the left, we're pretty sure they're happy in the job. There's still a low chance that they resign, but it's only a low chance. And on the vertical axis, the y-axis, if they did resign, how hard would it be for the company to replace them? What would be the impact? At the top of the scale, high impact. It will take us six months to a year to recruit someone, train them, and replace the person that we've just lost. In the middle, medium impact. It'll take us three to six months to recruit, train, and replace. And down the bottom, low impact. We'll advertise the job, we'll select a new person, and within two or three months, we haven't even remembered who it was that resigned. And again, the head of HR with each department head is going to put the names of employees into these nine box techniques. If your name is in that green box on the top left, there's a small chance that you might resign. And if you do resign, oh boy, it's going to be painful for the company. Well, then we need to make that small chance that you might resign even smaller. And how do we do that? Retention. The blue boxes, I'm pretty certain you're going to resign. And when you do resign, it's going to be painful for the company. So I better get ready now for that pain by doing succession planning. Do we do a succession plan for 100% of the management team? No way. We'd be wasting a lot of time and resource. But do we do a succession plan for the most vulnerable 33%? Of course we do, to be ready. And if the name of a manager is in one of those blue boxes, they're the people we're probably doing a succession plan for. The yellow boxes, there's a small chance, a medium chance that you might resign. So let's put our arms around you, give you the corporate cuddle, pull you into the bosom of the company, and engage you through more coaching and development to reduce the chance that you might resign, to increase the loyalty impact. The red box, well, there's a small chance you're going to resign. If you do resign, I'm going to replace you. But meanwhile, if you're performing well, I need to reward you properly and make sure that you're fairly paid. And the bottom right-hand corner, the brown box, the chance is very, very high that you're going to resign. If you do resign, 
I'm just going to advertise the job and replace you. So what shall I do? I'll do nothing. In fact, I might even prepare the farewell party. Now, the people the head of HR is getting interested in are the people who are in the green boxes in both diagrams. If your name is in the green box in this retention nine box, and your name is also in the green box in this talent management nine box, then you're almost certainly going to be in the retention bonus scheme. Who are the people who are going to be in the retention bonus scheme? It's the people called the double greens. They're in the green box in the nine box of talent management, and they're in the green box for retention and flight risk. And we'll try and manage it so that the double greens are roughly 5%, maximum 10% of our employees. If the number of double greens is more than 10%, we will go back to the nine box of talent management. And that middle right-hand side box that is currently green, we will convert that to yellow so that it reduces the number of people that are double greens. We'll change that middle right-hand side green box to a yellow box so that the number of double greens reduces. But if, on the other hand, the number of double greens is less than 5%, well, then we'll go to the flight risk diagram, and that blue box in the center at the top, we'll convert that to a green box. So it increases the number of double greens. We will try and manipulate these boxes so that the number of people who are double greens is roughly 5% of our employees, maximum 10% of our employees. And this answers the question of who. Who is going to be included in this secretive cash-based bonus scheme? That leaves another question. How much are we talking about? If the scheme is a three-year scheme, just how much money might we get as a lump sum at the end of those three years? Well, it actually depends, because you've got to look at the reasons why you are retaining a particular person. And it's called the three P's of retention. Are you retaining them simply because they have the potential to be a future senior manager? They're a key contributor today who has the potential to be one of the leaders of tomorrow, especially if they're an Emirati national or a Saudi national or a Qatari national that you really want to hold on to because they've got the potential for the future. Or maybe it's more than just potential. Maybe there's also pressure. There's a three-year project to be done, maybe implementing a new ERP scheme or launching an IPO or some project that has to be done within a certain deadline where there is pressure. And you can't afford people on the project team to leave you during the project. So you need to lock them in. You need them to guarantee not to resign for three years. Retention for pressure. How much are we going to give them at the end of that three years if they achieve the project and meet the milestone deadlines? And there might even be retention for pain. If two companies are going through a merger, they both might have a country manager in the UAE. They both might have a country manager in Bahrain, a country manager in Jordan. But when the merger is complete, you don't need two country managers anymore in each country. You only need one. So one of them is going to lose their job, and the other one is going to keep the job. But during the merger, you need both of them to stay with you. And the merger might take three months, three years rather, 
to implement. So during that three-year merger, you need both to stay with you. But at the end of three years, one of them might be facing pain because they're going to lose their job. How much money are we talking about? The rule of thumb, retention for potential is typically 25% of the cumulative basic salary for the duration of the retention scheme. So if we're looking at a three-year scheme, which is 36 months, well, 25%, a quarter of 36 months, is nine months. So we're looking at something in the order of nine months bonus at the end of the three years for people who've kept their promise not to resign, where they have the potential to be the future leaders of the company. Retention for pressure, it's a bit more generous. It's typically 33% of the period of the scheme. If the scheme's three years long, that's 36 months. 33% of 36 months is 12 months. We're looking at a lump sum bonus of one year's salary. And if it's for pain, two companies are merging together, the merger's going to take three years, and at the end of that three years, some people will be out of a job, but you need them to stay during the merger period, well then retention with potential pain is as much as 50% of the salary, the basic salary only, excluding allowances for the duration of the scheme. If it's a three-year retention plan, 36 months, we're looking at 18 months salary as the lump sum retention bonus. So this is big numbers. This is why it's so secretive. This is why it's so selective. Five to 10% of employees potentially getting a 25% at the end of three years lump sum retention bonus. Maybe even 33 or 50% if it's pressure or even pain. Which means you're looking at about 1% of payroll to fund this for 10% of people getting 25% of salary over a three-year period. It's about 1% of annual payroll that you need to set aside. So these are the key elements of retention plans. Highly secretive, managed by the head of HR, highly selective, specific individuals, but very, very big numbers at the end of the three years. So that's the end of the presentation on retention and retention bonus schemes and nine box techniques. I'm doing another webinar next Tuesday on competencies and how to use behaviors and competencies in performance management. And then in two weeks time, we've got the 20th annual Middle East Compensation and Benefits Forum being held at the Address Hotel, Dubai Mall here in Dubai. On Sunday the 29th of May and Monday the 30th of May, I'm doing a couple of masterclasses, a one-day masterclass all about pay for performance, and then another one-day masterclass all about benchmarking techniques and designing pay scales that are competitive with the market. And then on Tuesday and Wednesday, we've got some of the top speakers from across the region, some of the top experts on Comp and Ben from some of the biggest companies such as General Electric and Microsoft who are going to be addressing the two-day forum. So I hope I'll see some of you or many of you at that event. At this stage, I'm happy to open it up to questions. So we're going to open the little box on the screen that I'm looking at here. So if you want to start typing in your questions now, I'll try and address them one at a time. They only stay on my screen for a little while, and if too many questions come in, some might drop off. So let's go in order. Sunil says, what if a company doesn't have a competence framework? Simple, Sunny. You need to design one. And if you need help, get in touch with me. Yasser says, do we get a copy of the presentation? 
Well, yes, sir, if you heard Mega at the beginning of the presentation, you would have heard her say that she'll be sending out an email to the people that have registered with the web link of where you can download the presentation. It will be available for the next four weeks, and then it will vanish into cyberspace. Lisbeth says, what is your head of HR is like what if your head of HR is located in another country? Well, fly them here. Fly them to wherever they need to be in order that they can do their secretive nine box techniques. When I was senior vice president at Emirates, part of my schedule each year was visiting every country to determine in each country who the people would be that I felt we had to retain. Yasir says, what is the rationale behind the percentage of bonus? Well, Yasir, ask yourself, if you got a letter from your company asking you to sign that letter, guaranteeing not to resign for 36 months, how much would you personally want to be tempted to sign that letter? I personally wouldn't sign it for less than six months' salary as a bonus. So nine months, 25% of three years, that's going to capture the majority of your people. There'll be a few greedy people who still say it's not enough. Well, they're not the sort of people you want to retain. But it comes from motivation, psychology, and pragmatism. Lisbeth says, for the personal delivery of the retention letter, what if the head of HR is in a different country? Uh, visit them or use a courier. And when the courier delivery opens, talk to them through Skype. If there's easy ways to talk to people these days. Pavithra says, what if we want the majority of the workforce in a particular department is seen as key to the organization growth? Would you recommend retention? I would never recommend retention for more than 10% of a particular population. The moment it becomes more than 10%, it's like throwing confetti at a wedding. It just flies everywhere and doesn't necessarily work. If you need to retain 60, 70, 80% of a particular department, then you need to come up with something that is specific. Maybe a performance-related bonus scheme linked to the results of the department or some incentive scheme or some other mechanism that you use your company bonus scheme to divert money for a specific issue. Fahad says, should we keep implementing the program and include new staff every year? Yes, you will typically either do a new scheme every three years in sequence, or maybe even a new scheme every year so that the schemes are running in parallel, and it's an ongoing process. Abigail says, how legally enforceable are the retention bonuses? Well, the type of letter that you're going to issue to the employee, that the employee will sign, is legally enforceable. The company is making an offer, and the employee is accepting that offer. Therefore, under the eyes of the law, it's called tort, which is a contractual obligation it would be pretty bad of the company not to meet that obligation. I, as an employee, wouldn't want to work for a company that renegaded on that obligation. If an employee gets one of these letters and the company doesn't pay the money, they've got a very, very good chance of winning in the labor courts if it is contractually signed and agreed. And it should be. As an employee, you'd want it in writing. Ahab says, how can we balance between transparency and motivating everyone with the high potentials while we have the secret actions? Well, there's no way this scheme is going to be transparent. That's the last thing on earth you want to do. If the scheme's transparent, you might be retaining 10% of your staff and motivating them, but you've just upset the other 90%. And collectively, they're probably just as important, if not more so. So you do not want transparency at all. This is the most non-transparent thing that I can think of in the whole of HR. Hamdan says, 
In some cultures, such bonus schemes cannot be so secretive. Have you seen this applied? Uh, Hamdan, I'm not sure what you're asking if I've seen applied. Do you mean, have I seen these secretive retention schemes applied? Absolutely. 60, 70, 80% of companies here in the region are doing this, and it is being kept confidential. Yasir says, what are the other ways of identifying people apart from a discussion between the head of HR and head of departments? Very, very difficult, Yasir. You have to be able to have a good performance management scheme. You have to be able to have a good talent management scheme. If you haven't got effective ways of identifying your top 5% of talent, then all of this presentation is falling on stony ground. Please don't do retention schemes. You've got to identify the key 5% first. Hamdan says, why are we reloading, rewarding those in the low impact, low likelihood to resign? Well, if they're performing well, of course you're rewarding them. Company bonuses, profit share schemes, they're contributing, they're doing a good job. They're not likely to be promoted, they're not likely to resign, but you still need to reward them to motivate them. So don't forget the other people as well. And Nas says, if someone is already leaving or has resigned, is it okay to discuss this type of bonus? In a word, no. If they've decided to leave or resign, they've implicitly broken the loyal contract already. They are the type of people that you don't really want to retain, because if you do retain it, then you're only really doing it under duress. You're simply denying the inevitable. They're going to be gone within a couple of years. If they want to go, let them go and get yourself someone better. Afrian says, our managers the only sources of identifying the company's talents that we need to retain them. Well, you'll use every resource at your technique. The head of HR will talk to the head of talent. The head of HR will talk to the head of L&D. The head of HR will talk to all the line managers. The head of HR will go to incredible lengths personally to make sure that this is being done as objectively as possible. Use every single tool at your disposal. Hamdan says, do we link the nine box with salary? Probably not. Salaries should be linked to performance. Yes, the top performers in the first nine box, of course, they should be getting higher bonus schemes, hence reward. But other than that, the nine box techniques are not a compensation tool. They're a talent management tool. And I think, oh no, Anas, how come the finance director is not in the picture? Well, the finance director is the person that's going to have to process the payments. So therefore, they know who is in the scheme. If they weren't personally in the scheme, but they knew the scheme existed, they'd be pretty upset processing payments because they'd be thinking, hey, why aren't I getting some of this? So keep it simple. The head of HR, the head of finance, and the CEO are simply not eligible. If they're key, find another way to retain them, but don't use the retention plan. Set the rule in place that they're not eligible, and then they can't be upset because you haven't broken the rule. Okay, that is the end of the questions. If anyone has put a question that I haven't answered, cut and paste it quickly and retype it. If not, it is 5.29, bang on the hour. I think that's a great place to finish. Uh, those of you who are typing notes of thanks, I appreciate it very much. Uh, one last question from Ehab. In the case of changing the CEO or changing the head of HR, should the agreement, should the agreement have such agreements? Not sure what you mean, Ahab, but these retention schemes will supersede a head of HR or a CFO resigning. When one head of HR resigns, the first thing they do is they say to the incoming head of HR, here is file 13. And I can remember when I took over as senior vice president HR, 
at Emirates, I can remember being given file 13 by my predecessor. Very enlightening it was indeed. So the scheme continues. Okay, everyone, it's 4.30, uh, 5.30 here in the UAE. I hope it's been a good hour. I hope it's been informative. Thank you for attending, and that is the end of the webinar. I hope in due course you'll get to hear it again and download it. Meanwhile, have a good evening. Bye, all.